Does South Africa have too many foreigners? Are foreigners the problem in South Africa? Spread the fire and welcome to SMWX. Today, we are talking about immigration, the big, big debate that nobody wants to have, or whenever they have it, they're accused of being xenophobic, Afrophobic, haters, if you will. Let's have that conversation. So the way I'm going to structure our conversation today is to give you the demographic numbers, to look at some of the interesting cases that have come out uh, in the South African Constitutional Court, and then finally to look at the proposals that are coming from the white paper from the Department of Home Affairs. And then we're going to explore whether or not these are good or bad ideas. Let's get into it. Spread the fire. Spread the fire. Spread the fire. First thing, if you were not aware, there were 800,000 foreign-born people living in South Africa in 1996. By 2001, when the next census was held, that number had gone up to 1 million, so about 400,000 increase. But interestingly, by the 2011 census, the number had gone up to 2.2 million foreign-born people living in South Africa. So the number doubled. And according to the latest census, the census 2022, it showed that there were 2.4 million international migrants living in South Africa, which equates to about 3% of the total population. Where are these people coming from? First country leading with 45% of the immigrant population is Zimbabwe. Then the next country is Mozambique with 187 Then you have Lesotho with 10.2%, right? So close to 80% of all of the immigrants living in South Africa are coming from three countries. Then you have, interestingly, the other countries being Malawi and the United Kingdom contributing to the top five. And according to the Census 2022 data and information, this top five has remained the same since 2011. Now, there's something that I want to say uh, about the Census 2022 data. There was some undercounting in that information. So the number is likely to be more than 2.4. And according to um, the United Nations Population Division, they say that there are 4.2 million people who are foreign-born living in South Africa. Significant number as well, but small percentage of the total population being uh, 62 million. So those are the numbers. Those are the numbers. What is the relevant law how do we get to the position where you have people living, foreign-born people living in South Africa? Different laws affect this, but I'm going to start with the 1951 Refugee Convention and the 1967 Protocol. So the 1951 Convention is the cornerstone of international refugee law. It defines a refugee as someone who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted, for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion is outside the country of his nationality and is unable to or owing to such fear unwilling to avail himself to the protection of that country. So let's unpack that. What constitutes a refugee? someone who has a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons which are established. Number one, race. Number two, religion. Number three, nationality. Number four, membership of a particular group or political opinion. So you need to have both of those elements to qualify. You need to have a well-founded fear of persecution and it has to be on the basis of an identified reason. If you are moving from one country to another country on the basis of economic interests, you do not qualify to be considered a refugee. So that's the definition. What are the principles around international 
um, refugee law. The principles are, number one, non-refoulement. The idea of non-refoulement is that you can't just send people back to the country that they just left because these people have just left saying that they have a legitimate fear of persecution, a legitimate fear of actually being harmed as a result of how they identify or their ideologies, tribe, race, gender, sexuality, um, all of those things that you can imagine. So you are not supposed to send these people back. This is going to be critical to a later discussion that we're going to have, right? And they're not supposed to be any penalties for illegal entry. So international refugee law recognizes that refugees may be compelled to enter a country without authorization. And there are processes in the Refugee Act which then allow for steps that person has to take to apply for that. So someone starts off being an asylum seeker. They go and they make an application. And on the basis of the determination of that asylum seeker application, they then become a refugee. If they are a refugee for a certain amount of time, then they can then make an application for permanent residence. Moving from the permanent resident status, you then get into a citizenship application. And that takes a considerable amount of time, but there is a pathway from refugee to citizen, or if you will, from asylum seeker to citizen in South Africa as things stand. So the Refugee Act is the law in South Africa which deals with the refugee issues. What are the rights of refugees? Under a full application of the 1951 Refugee Convention and the 1967 Protocol, refugees have the rights to work, they have the right to education, and they have the right to access public relief and assistance. They have the freedom of religion, access to court, and freedom of movement within a country. So under South African law, what you will find is that those refugee rights are fully extended to them. The obligations of the states which host refugees are to cooperate with the United Nations, to adhere to the principle of non-refoulement, and to ensure basic human rights and dignity for refugees. So that's important to understand. Most of the time when we are having conversations about immigration, we're having conversations either about uh, people who are economic migrants. We're having conversations about refugees. And it's important to then think through whether all of these things apply to the groups that we identified earlier. If you recall, what I said earlier is that Mozambique and Zimbabwe are the biggest contributors of refugees to, not refugees, uh, immigrants to South Africa. So let's walk back a little bit and ask ourselves the question, why? Why do we have all of these uh, people from Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Lesotho in South Africa? First reason, democratic collapse in those respective countries. We know that the Zimbabwean democracy collapsed and accelerated in collapse from the year 2000. If you recall, the 2001 census said that there were 1.1 million, 1.1 million foreign-born people living in South Africa in 2001, but there were 2.2 million by 2011. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what happened between 2001 and 2011 that made 45% of all um, foreigners living in South Africa come from one country? What happened was the land seizures in Zimbabwe and the rigged elections in Zimbabwe. When the land seizures started in 2000, Zimbabwe started losing credibility on the international stage. Sanctions were imposed and they were, there was a rise of a challenger to Robert Mugabe and that challenger being the movement for democratic change led by Morgan Tsvangirai. Then there was an election in 2002, and that election was fundamentally a very violent election, an election where people's rights were violated, and the ZANU-PF was moving like a mafia. And as a result of that, there was an exodus of people leaving Zimbabwe 
entering South Africa. There was also another election which was disputed in 2008. What happened in that election is that Morgan Swangirai won the first round. There was a second round, and in that second round, Morgan Swangirai pulled out because Robert Mugabe, Emerson Mnangagwa unleashed violence on the people of Zimbabwe. And as a result of that, a special visa was created for people who fled from Zimbabwe uh, fleeing the political turmoil which happened. And that visa has been the subject of um, legal disputes in and of itself. And there's a legal dispute that we're going to talk about more specifically to that particular visa. But as things stand right now, people who have uh, exemption permit, a Zimbabwe special permit, have been allowed to live in South Africa for two more years as per decree by the minister. So now we've kind of like unpacked how and why there are lots of Zimbabweans. Why are there lots of Mozambique citizens living in South Africa? Same reasons. There was a civil war in Mozambique. And as a result of that civil war, there was a lot of instability in the country and people moved out of the country. When the civil war was resolved, the ruling party, Frelimo, has basically came into power and has been in power ever since. But Frelimo is not viewed as being a legitimate government by many people because they rig elections as well. So what I'm trying to put across is that when you have rigging of elections, when you have democracy um, not functioning, what you then have is this unintended effect of people living their country. Why? Because the failure of democracy leaves, leads to economic collapse. So I want to do some... Um, what, what, what can we call it? Uh, source, source-based analysis. So the book that I have here is Why Nations Fail by Darren Asimoglu and James A. Robinson. These two guys are very good economists who put a book together trying to think about why is it that we have these levels of poverty, inequality, and basically state decline around the world. One of the things that they said is that if you have extractive economies and extractive institutions, you are not going to have successful economies. And one of the features consistent in extractive economies is that they have dysfunctional governments, and those manifest themselves in different ways. But dictatorships and failure of democracy is another one of those ways that they manifest. So if there is no democracy, or there is bad democracy, or there is dictatorship, according to these leading Econom economists, you are going to have the kind of impact that we see in Mozambique and Zimbabwe. So to put it in a nutshell, why do you have a lot of people from Mozambique and Zimbabwe living in South Africa? Because the democracies in Mozambique and, and Zimbabwe have failed. That's the first thing that we need to recognize. A lot of economic um, migrants who've left and also some people who've left as a result of political persecution. So having looked at this, what does the constitutional court think about all of these events, developments, and, you know, incidents in South Africa, if you will? The constitutional court in different judgments has made it very clear that they value and protect dignity. The dignity of um, everyone living in South Africa, be they refugee, uh, be they permanent resident or citizen. And they've also dealt with various elements of cases to make sure that it's clear where they stand and to make sure that the rights of refugees as well as citizens are upheld. So I'm going to tell you about the first big, not the first one, but a very big case that um, created this particular legal framework, if you will. In Dawood and Another versus Minister of Home Affairs, this case pertain pertained to families that were composed of South African citizens 
and non-South African citizens. And it pertained to whether or not they had a right to be granted resident status in South Africa and how they could apply for those residence permits. And what the court said is that there is a right to having family life, and it's part of the right to dignity. And the, the court said that the right to enter into and sustain permanent intimate relationships is part of the right to dignity. And they say that entering into and sustaining a marriage relationship are of defining significance for many people. Not only legislation that prohibits the right to form a marriage relationship infringes the right to dignity. Any legislation that significantly impairs the ability of spouses to honor their obligations to one another would also limit such a right. A central aspect of marriage is cohabitation and the right and duty to live together. Legislation that significantly impairs the ability to honor this obligation constitutes a limitation to the right to dignity. So this case cons concerned these applications that people were making for these p permits, relative visas, etc., and they couldn't make these applications successfully. There were inconsistencies, and they were not necessarily succeeding all the time. And what the court said is there's a right that people have to enter into marriage, and that needs to be upheld. The dignity part of it was an important element. So it set the ball rolling. The second court case that we need to consider is the case of Nandutu and others versus Minister of Home Affairs. This is a more recent case that pertains to um, 2019 judgment. In this particular case, Nandatu, what happened here is that Miss Ndatu, who was a Ugandan citizen, came into South Africa on a temporary visa and she wanted to change her visa. But the regulation um, in Section 99 of the immigration regulations required that you need to leave the country to make an application. But Ndatu had a child with the South African citizen. And what then they approached the court to do, to say, like, listen, this regulation 99 is inconsistent with the constitution insofar as it harms the dignity of the applicants and prevents them from fulfilling their duties. So if you look at Dawood, Dawood was dealing with the rights of couples. Nandatu deals with the rights of the child, so to speak, and upholds the right of the child. And how does it do so? It says that when you force a mother to go out of the country to apply for a visa, a mother of a South African citizen, that violates the best interests of that child. And therefore, the regulation, Section 9.9, .9, is inconsistent with the Constitution, inconsistent with the interests of the child, and inconsistent with human dignity. So if you follow, Dawood deals with couples. Ndatu deals with, Nandatu deals with the children and the rights of the child. Then there was a recent case right? And this case is Raymond and others versus Minister of Home Affairs and others. This one deals with what happens if there's a divorce. Are you, are you seeing the, we went from marriage, we looked at children, now we're looking at what happens if there's a divorce. The court said that you cannot terminate someone's resident status because they separated from their partner. Under the Immigration Act and the regulations around it, you can remain in South Africa as a relative on a relative visa as long as you are married to the other person. But the applicants in this particular case is different, different background stories. But fundamentally what happened is they all got into a bona fide, well-intentioned, legitimate relationship with a South African had a child with that South African, worked and lived in South Africa for a very long period of time. Then there was a separation. And because of the separation, they were now required to leave the country and then make a plan. And lots of them said, look, if I leave the country, I'm not going to be able to provide for my kids because all of my economic relationships and status are based in South Africa. I've been living here for a long time. And also, I don't even know how long it's going to take because the kind of applications that we're talking about, uh, relative visas, permanent residence visas, take a very long time, two, three years sometimes with the home affairs. So what they then said, uh, this is the court, they said that's a legitimate concern. 
And that if you have a bona fide relationship and have intention to take care of your child, you can change your status while living in South Africa and you can access residence status based on that relationship. So that's the court, uh, that's the case that happened recently. They also took time to um, dismiss one other guy who had applied for the same thing, Mr. Tapio Tembo, who had been in and out of the country illegally and tried to actually go with these other people and say, me too, I also want to be recognized and given status. And they said to him, he hadn't exhausted all of the remedies available to him, but also that he approached the court with dirty hands. You cannot approach the court with dirty hands. The court won't wash your hands. What this means is that if you've been breaking the law and then you want to use the court to try to cover up your basic uh, misbehavior, they're not necessarily going to do it. So if you, if you, if you see what's happening, let me just read um, what the court said, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll continue with the commentary. The requirement that the foreign national must leave the country and apply for change of his or her visa status from outside South Africa meant that if she was working or carrying on a business, or he or she had to leave his or her job and go outside the country and apply from outside the country. This could take many months, and if he or she is not granted another visa status, it might mean that he or she would not be back in South Africa for a long time or permanently. If that foreign national had a child with a South African citizen, it meant that he or she is put in an invidious position where he or she had to either take his child with him or leave the child behind and be separated for ch from the child for a long time. It also meant that the foreign national who is a parent to a minor child who is a South African citizen would no longer be able to support his minor child because he or she would have lost his or her job. The court then said this is not a tenable position and gave uh, the Department of Home Affairs two years to rectify this issue. So that's what that's what the court determined in the latest in the latest case. So if you look from Dawood, which was couples, Nandatu, which was children, to now uh, Raymond, which looks at the issue of when those couples are separated, you can see that the constitutional court values quite significantly right to life and upholds the Refugee Act and upholds the rights to dignity, even for foreign nationals. So there are other cases that deal with um, prisoners who have been detained, who are foreign, and what rights they have. The courts have also said we uphold their rights in the way that we uphold anybody else's rights. So this has put the Department of Home Affairs at loggerheads, basically, with the Constitutional Court position and has created an impetus for them to say, we need to change the whole immigration framework. And right now, there is a white paper that the Department of Home Affairs has published that is now open for comment. They're actually trying to make sure that they can pass these um, reforms to change the immigration framework altogether. So what does the white paper actually say? They want in the white paper to repeal the Refugee Act in its entirety. And they want to redraft the Refugee Act with exceptions that limit the economic activity of refugees. So they want to limit the right to work, the right to education, and the right to certain social services that refugees currently have. Right? And they also want to have the right to refoulement. Remember the, the principle that I mentioned earlier, that when you, are, um, w when you have the Refugee Act in full effect, you cannot refoul refugees, you cannot send them back to their home country. But what the white paper says is that they actually want to be able to deport refugees in the situation where there's an assessment that their conditions in the home country have actually changed, right? So where do you stand on that particular issue? Do you think, and I've heard other people say this before, that there are no refugees from Zimbabwe because every December they go home. So how are they refugees? Um, so where do you stand on that particular thing? Do you think that there are refugees from Mozambique and Zimbabwe? Or do you think that there are no refugees from those particular countries? But I must note that those who are under the, uh, the ZEP, the Zimbabwean exemption permit, they are actually allowed to travel 
in and out of the country. It's a different permit that was given to a class of people under the Refugee Act, which the minister is also allowed to do. You can do that. And that's what was done as the conditions in Zimbabwe were chaotic. Uh, so that's a different provision. But this is what the white paper seeks to do in respect to refugee status. In respect to citizenship, what the white paper wants to do is to change the um, requirements or the pathways to citizenship, right? What do they want to change specifically? If you recall, from the cases, you can see that married people can become um, temporary residents and then they can then become permanent residents of South Africa. And once they are permanent residents of South Africa, they can then become citizens down the stream. So if you get married to a South African, you can eventually become a citizen. If you come into South Africa as a refugee, you can eventually become a citizen because you start off asylum seeker, then you become a refugee, then you become a permanent resident, and after that you can then become a citizen. So what the Refugee Act says, or the, sorry, the White Paper says, is that South Africa doesn't have resources to allow people to access citizenship through these different ways. And what they then want to do is to have more stringent requirements preventing non-born South Africans or people who are not born in South Africa from attaining ref uh, citizen status through marriage, from attaining citizenship status through refugee uh status and also from attaining citizenship status through having lived in South Africa for a very long time as a minor. Because under the current act, if you have lived in South Africa your whole life, even if you were not born in South Africa, but you lived in South Africa as a child, went to the schools, etc., etc., and when you become an adult, you can actually also apply and become a citizen. So what the current state uh, white paper says is that it doesn't want any of that. It goes on in more detail, but for brevity's sake, I think these two highlights um, show you where things stand. And you can actually comment on this particular white paper right now. It's something that the Minister of Home Affairs, Aaron Mutsoledi, is trying to push through and make sure it becomes a reality. Having said that, having given you this context, I want to go to the second book that... Um, is relevant to think about right now. Ugh. Okay, I was reaching for the book. Got it. This book here is called The Great Experiment. It came out last year. It's a book by Yasha Monk, and it explores a deeper question that I want to put to you. And that question is, do we want diverse democracies or do we want monolithic democracies? To give some context, at the time that I'm recording this particular episode, I don't know what time it will show up on, on YouTube, but at the time that I'm recording this episode, there's a big debate happening in the United Kingdom. And that debate is about what to do with um, asylum seekers who arrive into uh, the United Kingdom, either by boats or other means. And what the United Kingdom Tory government wants to do is to send them to Rwanda. But their courts have said that the Rwanda scheme is not legal. And this week, uh, the week of our recording, there's going to be a big debate in the UK Parliament because of this particular issue. And what has happened in the UK is that they have seen an increase as and when their colonies ended. They've seen an increase in the number of non-British-born people living in, 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 in UK, becoming UK citizens, and um, even getting into positions of leadership in the UK. And there's a pushback to that. And we saw that with even Boris Johnson. We saw that with Brexit. There is a resistance to this idea of having the UK diversify further. And those who are on the right wing in the UK say that the Muslims, the Africans are changing the identity of the United Kingdom and taking it away from its British roots. So there's a big debate happening there. Do you think that the UK government is justified to move away from its international obligations 
under the Refugee Convention and take refugees that come into its country, send them to Rwanda. So that's one set of, of, of thoughts. In other parts of Europe, we've seen the rise of far-right politicians, such as in Italy, where they've also said that there are too many Muslims in Italy and Muslim immigrants are causing problems, so they must be um, deported, they mustn't be allowed into the country. In Africa, different scenario altogether, we saw the president of Tunisia saying that there were too many Africans from sub-Saharan Africa coming into Tunisia, changing the identity of Tunisia. What do you think about that? Do you think that Africans were going to Tunisia and, you know, destabilizing Tunisia? Or do you think that that particular rhetoric was xenophobic, Afrophobic? And I'm using different examples to show you that it manifests in different ways. And as you know, Donald Trump said of Mexico, this is what he said. He said, Mexico, they're not sending us their best people. They're sending us rapists. They are sending us murderers. They are sending us, you know, less than ideal citizens. Not a direct quote, but that's basically what he said about Mexicans. And the anti-immigrant rhetoric of Donald Trump was part of what led to him rising and ascending to power. And when he got into power, he implemented a ban on immigrants from Muslim countries. He wanted to build the wall, as you know. So this book, The Great Experiment, explores the rise of these far-right politicians. It explores the rise of ethno-nationalism, where people are saying, we don't want people who are coming out, who are coming from other parts of wherever, because these people are causing problems for us. They are taking jobs, they are raping women, they are committing crimes. This rhetoric is not unique to uh, South Africa. It happens in America, it happens in Tunisia, it happens in Italy, it happens in the United Kingdom. And it is a phenomena that is associated with diversi diversifying democracies. So this book, The Great Experiment, is about how a lot of the developed nations in the world started getting diverse populations from different parts of the world for different reasons, different historical reasons, and whether or not those democracies can work. It speaks about the strength of diversification, but also points out the challenges of diversification. Going to the last book, and I want you to see if you can read these books, see if you can develop your own um, thoughts on it. This one was written by a scholar called Francis Fukuyama, Liberalism and Its Discontents. He explores the idea of democracy fundamentally as part of the classic liberal tradition. And part of that is around accepting tolerance, around equality, and around seeing each other as human beings. And he makes the argument that democracy in and of itself works when you have tolerance, equality, and when you have this respect of diversity. And some of that diversity comes from uh, foreign nationals and not necessarily just monolithic groups uh, indigenous to a particular country. So he makes the case that when you have diversification, you have better economic out outcomes for that particular country. These three books make the case that democracy is good, diversity is good, and that you want to embrace diversification. So contrasting that with the white paper, do you think that the white paper is limiting diversification or just a way of making diversification work for South Africa in a way that is reasonable? We must be fair and acknowledge that there has been a large number of foreign nationals coming from Mozambique, Zimbabwe for economic reasons. And that has created strain on the South African social fabric. It has created strain on South African hospitals, South African police stations. And we must acknowledge that some criminal elements come from other countries as well. 
it's fair for us to acknowledge that we cannot be dismissive of that. When you have an influx of people, some of the people coming in become gardeners, some of them become maids, some of them work at macro, some of them uh, will steal your phone. That's part of it. But we must also be fair to acknowledge and recognize that not everyone who is in the country is in the country con committing nefarious um, actions. Many are students, many are on skills visas, and many are on this special dispensation visa, be they from Lesotho or Zimbabwe. So as we're having this conversation, it's a very delicate conversation. And I've tried to approach it fairly and objectively. But as we're having this conversation, let's stay within the realm of facts. Let's stay within the realm of facts and try to have a robust debate. I know it's going to be a robust debate, but as much as, as we can have that robust debate, as long as we're staying within facts, we can comment on whether or not this white paper has good ideas or the white paper has bad ideas. So we're out of time, but I want to invite you Let's let's talk in the comment sections. I want to invite you, if you haven't already, subscribe. A lot of you are not subscribed. We see the data. Don't just be here every week, week in, week out. There's that button there. You see it. Eh? Just do, do what you need to do to that button, right? And share this video. Let's spread the conversation. Take it to TikTok. Take it to Twitter. Take it wherever you want to take it so that people know we're having these conversations, right? We can have conversations as young people, as young thinkers, and enlighten and educate each other. Thanks so much for watching to the end. Aye, yeah.